And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to A Church in a World, where it is our honor and privilege to be able to strive to coach anyone up on what God says from his word and not what we would like God to say from his word. So I hope you have had a blessed week. Welcome to December. Uh, again, as I think I mentioned last week, December's a very exciting month, obviously, as we celebrate the Lord's uh, birth. Uh, this, this month, again, as I said last week, we're not going to get into the debate of whether it actually was in December or not, but this is when we actually celebrate that time, when we celebrate that time. So let's get right into it right away. When I was growing up, and even now, I like stories. So now I I can't say I really enjoy reading. Now, if I get into a book and read it, I, I, I do enjoy it. But just actually going and getting a hardcover book or even now on a tablet or a, my, the phone I'm blessed with. I can't say I really love that, but it's better than what it used to be. I really like watching movies or miniseries or television uh, dramas. Uh, that's what I really get into. And I've now gotten better in the car. I, I really enjoy listening to audiobooks. And I gravitate to the stories of good versus evil. I've always gravitated, even when I wasn't a Christian, that that always, uh, I, I just enjoyed watching those stories and obviously rooting for the good guys. And what makes a really good story, though, is that the protagonist, representing good, and the antagonist, representing evil or bad or whatever, they're close in strength or power or whatever is that, you know, sometimes the protagonist, he's being successful, but sometimes then the antagonist is being successful and it goes back and forth. And, you know, some shows ends and it's not where the protagonist even wins. Sometimes the antagonist wins or it's like a draw. and with those types of stories, obviously you're going to also end up with stories where you have a protagonist and antagonist, and the protagonist is God, and the antagonist is Satan. And so we get into the mindset when we're watching those sorts of stories that we equate them, the God and Satan, as being on the same level, like with any other of the stories where we're talking about just two humans. And that's totally wrong. And that depiction in cinema or television or even now with streaming, that is, uh, how can I say, promoted in a sense that God and Satan are like battling it out. You know, they're, they're like, almost equals or they're like equal and i get it because with all the sin and destruction and pain and suffering in the world it's like it seems that way but it's not it's not and if you've been with us for any time you know we are following jesus chronologically through the bible and we're at the place where jesus makes Well, how can I put this? Jesus is going to do something. We're in the part where he's doing some of his miracles. That I don't want to say clearly shows because then I'm going to show from the rest of the Bible. But clear, I'll say this. Jesus clearly shows that Satan is not God's equal. That Satan is not God's equal. Let's pray. Most gracious and wonderful, 
Heavenly Father, our brother and our Lord Jesus, and dear Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. Oh God, please help me today, right now, in communicating your word to your people. Lord, I ask you this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Let's just get right, let's put up on the screen right away. Is our focus text for today is going to be from Mark. But as we talked about last week, this is an event which is described by two other eyewitnesses. And so what we have on the screen is all of the text, scripture text, from Mark, Luke, and Matthew on this event. And we're going to be able to use all of that information in what we're discussing today. And all is a very good word to talk about right now because we need to communicate something here, which, again, if you are not studying, if you just read the Bible, I just say, just read the Bible. And yes, it, it is good to, to read the Bible, but we also have to remember the Bible is in English. And no, sorry, the Bible, at least for myself, in America, most of us were reading in English or maybe in Spanish. And in, oh, I forgot to say, take out your Bibles, by the way. Make sure you have them out and ready because we, again, go through scripture and want to be able to make sure that you are following us, following us along in scripture. And the second thing, I forgot to say hi. For those of you here in the United States, here in Virginia, uh, North Carolina, Georgia, who are following us here in the States, and also those of you in Liberia, Pakistan, and Malawi. So, hello, I almost forgot to do that again. Please forgive me. So, let's continue. So, all is an interesting word in this context when you look at those scriptures. And I'm, I'm actually going to go back to Mark. Chapter 1, 32 through 33. So uh, in your Bibles, you might want to have bookmarks in all those different places because we will be going back and forth between the different eyewitnesses there. All right. That evening at sundown, they brought to him, him being Jesus, all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. The whole city? everybody in the city. We need to understand something here. And uh, scholars believe at that time, Capernaum had around 1,500 people in the town. And we need to also remember in Capernaum in first century, even though it was Peter's house, and since he was a fisherman, he may have made a little more money than most people, the houses were small. So the ancient writers, and even, even now, even today, we see this, but even more so back then, they would use hyperbole to communicate where here they're saying all, not Every person, not all 1,500 people in Capernaum came to Peter's house. But it was to communicate that it was a large crowd, a big multitude. And so I, I want to point this out to you. This is just not me making this up. And again, like I said, scholars are saying this. This is not just me. However, let's go to some other examples in the Bible. Due to time, I'm just going to go to two. But I want you to see this 
that this is also in the Bible as well, other places in the Bible. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 5. Matthew chapter 3, verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan were going out to him. Now, the him here is John the Baptist. So if you go back to Matthew chapter 3, and I encourage you to read before verse 5, you're going to hear that John is baptizing and everything. And then they're saying, then Jerusalem and all Judea. Not just Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region about the church. Everybody. So this is more than Capernaum. And that's we know that's not the case. Not every single person did that. But it wants to give you, again, Matthew as the writer wants to give you the understanding there were a lot of people. Let's go to John. So, okay, we first were doing Mark, talking about the all. Now I showed you in Matthew. Now we're John. So this is a third different writer. Okay, John chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. John 12, verses 18 and 19. The reason why the crowd went to meet him, and this is Jesus, was that they heard he had done this sign. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. We know the entire world did not go after Jesus. Again, hyperbole used, and this is why it is very key, critical, 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 critical for us to understand context. Okay, when you actually, and this, those of you, when you have someone send you a scripture and and again, their motives may be sincere and genuine. I beg and plead with you. After you read that scripture, go back to that chapter, to that book, and read that scripture in context. At the very least, you need to read the whole chapter from where it came from. At the very least. This is critical for your proper understanding of what God is, is striving to communicate to you and to us. So, I uh, just needed to get that out of the way because that's important for what we're going to talk about even later and also as we go through the Bible. All right, so let's set the scene now. We know it's not all 1,500 people but there's a whole boatload of, it's, you know, it's packed, standing room only, line going out from the door of Peter's mom's house, okay, bringing all of these people who are sick and demon-possessed, okay, sick and demon-possessed on this. So, let's think about this from last week. We talked about last week that Jesus physically healed everyone that was brought to him who was sick. Everyone who was brought to him who was sick. Now, the question is, especially when we read all these three eyewitnesses, okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when we read this, was that the case for all who were demon-possessed? Now, the reason I say that is I'm going to read through all of the uh, parts of each of those authors and those eyewitnesses, and you, let me just read it, and then, then I'll talk about it after that. So we're going to, going to go to Mark chapter 1, 34a, so hopefully you just kept everything bookmarked, so I'm going to do Mark, then Luke, then Matthew, in the same sections of, of scripture of what I showed at the very beginning, okay? Probably should have said, you know, take a snap, snapshot. But hopefully you're reading in your Bible. You're reading in your Bible, which I prefer. Mark 134a, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. 
Luke chapter 4, 41a. And demons also came out of many. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And so last week, as you can see, let me go back a little. So Mark 134a, and remember we used Luke last week on purpose. So it says, healed many who were sick. But we actually were, were able to use all of the eyewitnesses and say, okay, wait a minute. That many meant all who were there, he healed. And there were many of them. So we were actually able to see that from looking at the different eyewitnesses. Here, it is understandable if some people would say, well, here, I read all of them. It just says many for the exorcism of those demons. It's like, so was Jesus not able to exorcise all of the demons? This is where sometimes it is... When people say, and I I know some of you may be getting sick of me saying this, it's like, you can't just read the Bible. You must study it. Reading, again, is better than nothing. But to to properly understand, it takes time. Takes some digging. Now, the gold and diamonds and rubies and emeralds that you're able to unearth are priceless. And it enables you to walk through this mission field on this side of eternity that we are on, which is very difficult for Christians all over the world, some more difficult than others. And if you are just at a surface level of reading your Bible and getting to know God, and all of us have to start at surface level, so we have to start somewhere. But again, our passion here at a church in a world is for you to be digging, is for you to extract the sweetest of sweet of the fruit that God is giving us. So let me give you some commentaries, and I'm just going to use two. And every single commentary said this when discussing well, was that what did that many mean? What did that many mean when it talked about uh, the affliction and the oppression of the demons? And Jesus, again, it talks about the many, whatever the many means, it says Jesus with a word cast it out and got rid of it. Just like with the healing, as we talked about last, when Jesus healed you, it was immediately and it was done. And you were perfect. Again, are totally healed. Same thing with demons, is that they are gone and it's done. All right. From the New Bible Commentary, Mark makes a distinction between the two groups, the two groups being those who are sick and those who are demon possessed. But Jesus healed them both. When Mark says many were healed, he does not mean that some were left unhealed but is simply referring to the numbers involved, similar to what we have been talking about, we talked about earlier, similar to that. All right, this is from another uh, another commentary or study Bible. The New King James Version, New Spirit-Filled. I think this is the study Bible. Many does not imply that there were some that Jesus could not heal, but simply that those he did heal were numerous. So again, it's talking about those, when we see many in these, in this instance, it's just talking about that there were a lot. 
but everyone that came to Jesus was healed, healed of their sicknesses and healed of their demon possession. But I can hear some of you, it's like, oh, you know, those are just men or women who are actually, who's studying about, and again, you can go to every, I, I can't, like I said, I didn't even list all of them on this, but this is where it's critical again. You let the Bible interpret the Bible. This is not just from them saying, ah, I want it to be that way. And so I just say it and I make it true. No, we we look in the Bible and we see what God says on these things. So let's go to Job. Job chapter 1, verse 6. And we're going to do 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now you continue reading chapter 1. What you will find out is Satan then goes and destroys everything he has. His property, his cattle, and even the children that the Lord blessed him with. Yes, Satan goes and kills all of the children that Job had been blessed with. From the Lord. But he didn't touch his body at all. But we're not done. Continue. Go to Job chapter 2. We're going to start right in the beginning. Excuse me. Verse 1 through 6. Job chapter 2. Verse 1 through 6. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them, to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. Verse 3, And Lord sa- and, and the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil, he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. All that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. Verse 6, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So what does Satan do? He goes and visits all sorts of diseases and boils and ugh, just terrible stuff. Keep reading chapter 2 on Job but he doesn't kill him. You know why? Because he can't. Because he can't. We need to always remember 
And this is so important for us, those of us who are followers of Jesus and have given our hearts and our souls everything to the Lord. He is our master. He is our God. He is our king. My wonderful darling wife, Angelique, has a great saying, which you've heard me say before, and I will say again. Satan to God is like a dog on a leash. He cannot do anything that God does not allow. Now that is hard to deal with because, wow, God, you're really allowing a lot of rough stuff happening in the world. A lot of rough stuff. And again, we have to have scripture interpret scripture. So as I close, I want us to go to, again, one of my favorite scriptures, Isaiah 46. Chapter, sorry, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, spoken, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. If you believe God's word, and this is just one of many scriptures as we have talked about God's sovereignty and unquestioned sovereignty and all the scriptures that talk about he does what he wants to do when he wants to do it how he wants to do it. Now, does that make it easy on us sometimes when we're dealing with suffering in our lives? It should give us comfort. I know it does for me. And reading Job reminds me, and reading what we saw here with the miracles of Jesus, because Jesus is alive. Folks, he is alive. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And the power, those of you who have given your lives to Christ and bowed the knee, you have God, the Holy Spirit, living in you. That same power that cured, healed all of the people brought to Jesus, whether it was due to demon possession or sickness or whatever, that same power lives in you. I I beg and plead with you to read the scriptures of God's power, but even more, even more importantly, of God's providential kindness and sovereign will over all of creation. Satan is not on God's level. Satan is not God's equal. (sighs) Father God, I know there are many people who are hurting. Lord, I ask you that you reach out, reach out your arms and draw them closer to yourself. That you comfort the brokenhearted. You give them a supernatural understanding 
of their current situation. You give them a peace that goes beyond all understanding. Lord, anyone within the sound of my voice, I just pray that if they don't know you, they continue watching this video or listening to this audio all the way to the end and go and watch or listen to the salvation message that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray they listen to that, that they know what the gospel story is. If they've never heard it before, I pray that you put on their hearts that after I disappear from the screen, that they're willing to listen to the instructions we have after that and go listen to that gospel message. And I pray, Lord, that you are moving on their hearts even right now for them to die to themselves and to bow their knees to you as king and accept you as their Lord and they become part of your family and they become my new brother and sister or sister. Lord, I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that you got something from this message. And if you believe that it would be helpful for someone else, please share it. I pray for, Lord, I ask a blessing on the rest of your week. And a blessing means knowing you better. Lord, do whatever you need to do in all of us. So we choose to know you better, to dig up those pearls of wisdom and understanding and insight, godly understanding, insight and wisdom so we can help ourselves and help others. For as we say here at A Church in a World, the church, the people, not a building. We want to be a people that goes out and gives comfort and love and hope to a hurting and dying world. We love you. God willing, we'll see you next week here at A Church in the World. God bless. Bye. If you have never heard the gospel or you would like to know it better, please visit us at thegospel.acidw.org. That is the gospel, T H E G O S. P E L dot A C I W dot O R G. If you have any questions, comments, or need help of any sort, please visit us at contact dot A C I W dot O R G. That is contact C O N T A C T dot A C I W dot O-R-G. We pray you have a blessed rest of your week, and God willing, we hope to see you here again at a church in the world. Love you. Have a great day.